right. Yeah. God is good. And all the time. Yeah. He's good. Y you know, when we try to understand the nature of our relationship with God, it's actually very helpful to pay attention to our human relationships. Why? Because they're both about relationships, right? So if you pay close attention and observe relationships with one another, you know, in the human realm, it actually gives a whole lot of insight right, into understanding kind of what our relationship with God would be like, and vice versa, right? We can get informed with our relationship with God and to, and to one another. And so if you observe human relationships carefully, you know, it's, it's not too difficult to realize that there are stages of love and trust in relationships, right? There are stages of love, right? And you've probably seen this before, okay? First stage usually is when people fall in love. Amen, y'all? How many guys fell in love before? Anybody? All right. Hey, every married person, you better raise your hand. You're going to get in trouble, all right? All right. <laughs> we all fell in love once, right? Even those who weren't married, right, who aren't married, you guys know what I'm talking about. Amen, all right? Love, love is amazing, right? You're head over heels about this person. Ooh, I really like this person. I feel like I can do everything for this person, okay? And this often leads into... Uh, the very blessed thing called marriage, okay? Uh, but then, okay, kind of the next stage often, right, is this, right? Couples inevitably enter into a stage of confusion. Can we get an amen, everybody? Yeah. <laughs> this often happens in a longer relationship or after entering into marriage, right? You begin to realize so many faults that you haven't seen before. And this is typically where a lot of couples feel like they have fallen out of love, right? Have you heard that before? How many of you guys ever fallen out of love before? Don't raise your hand, okay? <laughs> what, they <laughs> what they don't understand, okay, what they don't understand is that they have misunderstood desire for love. There's a big difference between the two. And we often in our culture confuse between desire and love, right? Many times when we say we love somebody, it's not love you're talking about. It's actually desire you're talking about, right? It's like I, I really think you're awesome, right? And I, wanna, I have a desire to possess you. For my own good and benefit. We won't say it like that, but deep inside, okay? That's often the case, right? But uh, the truth is that love is more about a commitment to serve the best of the other person. It's unconditional, right? Are you guys getting this? Desire is more about me, while love is actually more about the other person. And so once couples kind of hit this stage, right, uh, they often go their separate ways, right? They, uh, and we see a lot of that. Married and unmarried couples. Or, get this, they might actually stay together for the kids or for whatever practical reasons, but they live in a stale kind of relationship that has given up actually on true heart-to-heart -heart connection, and there's a very shallow trust and, and, and a shallow knowing of one another, and there's a lack of love and union, right? You pretty much live as decent roommates, amen? Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> Or here's another stage, okay? So often stage one, stage two, and it, but sometimes, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sad to say this, but sometimes some couples actually go through the hard work of searching their own hearts, having difficult but necessary conversations, and you end up learning so much about yourself, how selfish you are, right, and one another, and things that were hidden from your own understanding is revealed, right? And so there's repentance, there's humbling, there's, and eventually you grow into a deeper sense of intimacy and knowing of one another. You grow out of kind of a selfish desire into true love. And a deep-rooted sense of trust and union is cultivated. Have you guys ever seen couples like that? It's beautiful if you, if you meet a couple like that, right? Wow. <laughs> wow, right? <clears throat> All the couples are like, oh. Now, now <laughs> in a very similar way to this, okay, there are stages of love and, and trust in our relationship with God, actually, right? Well, we've been uh, in the season of Lent, and we've been kind of, we, we started out with talking about how, you know, the Lord loves us, and the gospel is about his kingdom that is available to us, right? We can have a relationship with him, but the key to that is actually our ability to trust him. And last week, we talked about the battle for trust, right? How, why it's so difficult, because there's a spiritual warfare going on over our ability and soul to be able to trust him. And today, we want to talk about, okay, what does it look like? What are the stages, right, or the development process of our relationship with God that we can actually grow into, right? And we want to do that through searching the book of Job, actually. 
How many guys all know the book of Job? It's not a book you should read to get a job. Okay, sorry about that. I've, I've known this book for a long time, okay? But as I have been, you know, in the past couple of weeks, re-studying this book in a deeper and a fresh way, my goodness, it's so deep and profound, right? And the, the, the message, the, the, you know, the truth that, are, that I desire to share is so important. So please, right, I really want to charge you, right, pay close attention uh, to really uh, wrestle and receive it, right? And I, and, I, and, I, and I come to you with that kind of posture and prayer, right? And so we want to pay attention to Job's journey of faith and his struggles in this book. And through it, discover the kind of three stages of faith and, and trust. So if, you're, if you have your Bibles or Bible laps or whatever, turn to Job. Okay, it's 42 chapters. Don't worry, we're not going to read all 42 chapters. Um, I'm just going to read the first three verses. And then I'm going to explain a lot be just because of uh, the lack of time, right? Even with that, I feel like it's going to be a little long. But anyways... Job chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. Let's read these at least first three chapters together in one loud voice. Ready? 1, 2, 3, go. There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. And all God's people said, Job was a really great guy, okay? Uh, he loved God. He did what was right, not only outwardly, but I believe genuinely, okay, w which we will find out from his heart. God actually calls him blameless in chapter 1, right? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? God calls this man blameless. And he was very wealthy. He was known as the greatest man alive in the East. He, so he, had a, he was a man of great faith. He was a man, a man of great character, actually, also, right? It's, it's, it's kind of... He found this on the web. Ooh, yeah, he found this on the web. It's kind of hard to, like, put those two together, uh, unfortunately, right? But he was a man of great wealth. Not only that, great character. And he had, actually had a very, very great life. In verse 4 and 5, it says his kids would party a lot, Okay? Uh, and, you know, after every party, though, he was so devoted to God and so fearing and revering of God that every, after every party that his kids would have, because usually wealthy families, you know, the kids end up having a lot of parties. Can we get an amen, right? After every party they would have, what would he do? The next morning he would give, offer sacrifices to God on behalf of every child just in case they did something stupid during the party last night, okay? <laughs> and something bad would fall upon them, right? So he, was, he was serious about his relationship with God, okay? Wow, what is going on? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Woo! All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Technology. <sighs> okay. So one day, right, in the, in the middle of that, uh, the scene is now in, in heaven, right? The, the third heaven where God's throne is. And you know, some angels show up. And among them, Satan actually shows up. The fallen one shows up. And God's like, Hey, what are you doing here, right? And, the, and the Satan goes, well, I've been hanging out all to and fro the, the earth, you know, the, the creation, because that's where you've put me there. Right? So I'm there, I'm walking around, and, <laughs> and, and, and God actually brings up Job. He's like, have you seen my amazing servant Job, right? Like, he's, he loves me. He's, he turns away from evil. He's, he's amazing, okay? Have you seen him? And, and Satan, in response, says what? Do you think he loves and serves you for, for nothing? For no reason? Think about it. You've put a hedge around him. You've blessed him. I, like, you've given him so much. I mean, no wonder he's going to turn back and love you and serve you. Hello, right? You scratch his back, he's going to come scratch your back. Hello, right? But hey, listen to this, right? If, if you take away everything, I guarantee you, right? He won't, he won't serve you and love you. And there's this kind of permission, if you would, that's given to Satan, right, to bring about kind of evil uh, in the world and particularly in Job's life here. And, and then all hell breaks loose, right? All hell breaks loose. Um, if you're honest, right, as, as I was reading this, you can't help but ask a couple questions here. First of all, right, come on. 
God, why in the world would you bring Job up to the devil? Anybody ask that question? Right. Why in the world, right? Why, Lord? And the second question is, and why would you allow the, uh, this kind of evil and, and, and mess, and allow the devil to mess things up so badly? Okay. To give you a little bit of background, the book of Job is um, one of the five books of the wisdom literature, right? There's a lot of different genres in the Bible. There's five books under the realm of wisdom literature, right, which is kind of poetry and, and narratives and these stories, okay, along with Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs or Song of Solomon, and the book of Job, right? So there's been some debate that of, you know, whether Job was a, was a real person and this actually happened or it was more like a story to demonstrate the truths of God. And I, I don't think it's really important, right? That's kind of the conclusion, right? The really important point is this, that there is a deep wisdom, right, coming from this literature, right, that is delivering to us what is very true about God and this world, about ourselves, right? And so we ought to pay close attention to what God is trying to portray, the wisdom and truth that God is trying to portray through this story of Job, actually, right? And if you pay attention as we are, there's some really deep and profound important truth that we just cannot afford to miss, right? Now, this conversation, okay, between God and Satan reveals a few important foundational biblical truths, okay? It's implied, right? And I kind of touched on this last week, but I'm going to reiterate it. First of all, it's this. You, you understand that God is actually above all, amen? That God is sovereign, actually. He is seated on, seated on the throne. He is in ultimate control. That's clearly demonstrated here. But under that bigger, larger sovereignty and, and, the, and the will of God, somehow in a limited time and space, God has allowed, right, that's kind of what we get, right, principle-wise, that God has allowed the devil, Satan, and his minions, right, to, to, to mess things up, okay, upon this earth, right? But it's important for us to understand, okay, that, you know, God is still, yes, he's ultimately in control, but under that, for a limited time and space, there's also this real spiritual warfare. And it's also important for us to remember that God is not the direct one who intends and causes any evil upon us. Right? He does not delight in our suffering. It's actually Satan and his minions that bring harm, attacks, accuses, condemns, tries to cause human beings to doubt and distrust and move away from God. Right? We have to understand these very important principles. Now, the, the next question, right? Why did God allow Satan and devils to mess things up in this way? Could it have God made a better world? Right? And the answer, I, I just want to put it plainly here. We don't have time to go into all the depths, but the answer is actually no. He couldn't have made a better world than this. If you think deeply enough, in order for there to be free creatures loving and serving God in a true relationships as we have it in our world, like we have it right now, there has to be the possibility of real evil and therefore also the possibility of all sorts of pain and suffering. Yes, even things like the Holocaust and Hitler, as dark and heavy and painful as things are, right? the kind of world that you and I live in inhabiting right now is actually necessary for there to be free human beings who worship God and follow his ways voluntarily in truth. Right? We can argue that maybe, you know, having no world, non-existent, why did you create it? Not having this would be better. Or maybe could, couldn't you, you know, actually, you know, have a world with, with no real possibility of evil, right? Wouldn't that be better? Yet that would be a world that is no different than just having minerals, rocks, and dead objects, right? And if you think about it, if you just think about deeply enough, philosophically, okay, uh, no, there's no, that world would be with no true goodness, love, and relationship. And if you think about it, in order to have the kind of relationship that we have with the Lord and the world and all the goodness and beauty and love, this world is actually, the kind of world we have is actually necessary, right? And so that's kind of a, a sidebar, but an important sidebar I wanted to put in. Coming back to the main story here, okay? Uh, with that important sidebar. Now, coming back to, to all hell breaking loose. Okay, we were there, right? All hell breaking loose. The trials in Job's life came in two waves. The first wave was what? Uh, you should read it, okay, in chapter one. But basically, all of his possessions, right, and all of his children were, were all, like, taken away from him. They, they were all killed. They were all taken away. Okay, I want, you, I want you to think about that. And you know what the response of Job was? That's where we get the song... Uh, you give and take away. You give and blessed be the name. You guys remember that song, right? That's where, that's the first response after that first wave of trials, right? It's crazy that Job still 
clings to God and says, you're still blessed, you're, you're still worthy, right? But then the second wave comes, and this time, it's a direct attack on his body. His whole body breaks out with sores. His, his <laughs> and so he's found there, sitting on ashes, picking up a, a broken piece of clay pot, scrubbing and scratching his rotting flesh. And his wife comes and looks at him and says, you still didn't give up on God? You know, uh, go curse God and die. Go kill yourself, basically, right? That, that's actually written in, in the scriptures. The wife. I mean, whoo, okay, marry the right person, everyone, all right? I mean, whoa, right? I mean, he's in this devastating situation here, right? And in this context, Job's three friends come to comfort him. And I, I, always, used to think, I always used to think that the three friends of Job were, like, really bad friends. But as I was rereading it, you know what I discovered? They actually weren't that bad. They came to genuinely love and care for him. And it says that they actually sat with him seven days and seven nights without saying a single word. Because I thought they just came and started like, oh, you sinner, whatever, right? But they, <laughs> they were actually pretty good, right? Because it says, because they were able to see how heavy and, and, and immense and, and incredible the, the sorrow and the pain that Job was going through, like they couldn't speak a single word, you know what I mean? They were just sitting there for seven days, seven nights straight without. And you know, in chapter, that's in chapter 2. In chapter 3, you know what happens? It's actually interesting that Job is the one who breaks the silence. <laughs> right? It's him. He, he couldn't take it anymore. So he breaks the silence, and in chapter 3, he says, Cursed is the day I was born. You know, he's angry. He's, he's just in so much pain. And if you read the, the following dozens of chapters, man, you just hear this poor guy and, and the real reality of, of the pain that he's going through in light of all the things that have, that have been going on, right? Feeling that God has betrayed him, right? He doesn't, you know, he's like, it was better that I wasn't born. He says that, right? I just want to die. Kill me already, right? Because he knows that life and death is in God's hand and he can't do that by himself, obviously. But he's like, I would rather be gone. Have any of you guys been in that kind of a place? Where you feel like, man, I feel like I'd rather just, you know, not be. And he's in that kind of a place. Experiencing extreme pain and suffering in every way. Relationally, economically, mentally, physically, emotionally, socially, spiritually. Literally in every way. And from there, the book kind of unfolds. Kind of the three friends after he breaks out, they, they now start replying and they go back and forth, which is like the most, the majority of the entire book of Job, actually. Until towards the end, there's this other random guy named Eliu comes and he kind of rebukes the three friends. He also rebukes Job and it kind of, he kind of becomes this segue where towards the end of the book, God finally appears to Job. And Job, because Job's been like longing, God, where are you? Show up. I want to talk to you. I have so much. Love. He's not giving up. He's, he's holding on. And finally, God shows up reveals himself to Job, right? That's kind of the climax where Job finally encounters God and have, has a revelation in person, right, with who God really is. And in response, he says only a few words, right? Um, and that's where we get the song that, uh, that, that Rachel led, right? Let my, uh, you are God in heaven, and here am I. This comes from this book too, right? A lot of songs come from Job, right? Uh, you are God in heaven, and here am I on earth. Let my world be few. And so his heart melts. All complaints, pain, and suffering is undone. He has a shift in his heart, and he's found actually to be sufficiently well somehow. And so that's his entire journey. So we can find three stages, right, of his faith and trust kind of developing and, and maturing and, and growing, right? Okay, are you guys ready? I'm going to try to derive three stages that we can discover through his journey here. First of all, it's the faith. The first stage is the faith or trust of propriety. Right? Propriety means what? What's proper and good, right? So it's kind of like a proper faith. In other words, you reap what you sow, okay? Right? You do good, you get good. You do bad, you get bad, right? That's the most basic moral framework that majority of people in our world live by, right? And so we can discover that Job started out with that kind of a faith, right? His friends obviously had that kind of a faith because if you read what they say to Job, they're pretty much like, we, we believe in this faith of propriety, this stage of faith. And so you know what they say? Job, 
You might not know what you've done, but you have, you must have done something real wrong. You know what I mean? Think hard, bro, and repent, right? They're just straight up like using that kind of a reasoning upon Job, actually, right? If you're part of the mentoring tribe, you all know you've been studying that, right? That, that's actually not the true case. But we realize Job's like that. Job's friends are like that. And so, you know, uh, this kind of faith of propriety, right, this proper kind of faith says something like this. I love you for all the good things you give me, right? And this kind of faith is not all wrong, guys. It's, it's, it's generally true, isn't it, right? Because it's also biblical that you do, in general, reap what you sow. But the only problem is that in our broken world right now, this isn't always the case. We all know that good things seem to happen to bad people, and bad things happen to seemingly good people, and things seem to be a bit arbitrary. Can we get an amen, right? If you don't believe in this, if you haven't lived long enough or you've been a little bit sheltered, you just open your eyes a little bit and you'll see it, right? That, man, things don't really make sense, like, in, this, in, this, in terms of this faith of propriety here, right? This proper kind of faith. And so if you continue to hold on to this faith, the natural response is disappointment. You become confused and even disillusioned. A faith of propriety tends to be ritualistic, right, instead of relational. It can tend to be transactional, all about rules and regulations in order to get what I want, instead of this intimate, trusting, loving relationship with God, actually. And so from here, you can either choose, right? And when you're stuck there, right, in this first kind of phase here, from here, you can either choose to remain in this proper, you know, propriety kind of faith. And that means you're going to continue to try to do the right thing to be blessed, or in some cases, after realizing that things are a bit arbitrary, you kind of lose hope and fall into despair. So you might come to church, but you don't pray or relate to God with much enthusiasm anymore. You just carry on with your own life because it is what it is. And faith and trust in God becomes like an afterthought. It's just something that you don't really like or love or want to talk about, but at the same time, you can't really get rid of, right? You have this awkward relationship with faith in God. You don't talk about it. You just move on. And I want to tell you that the real sorrowful part is that actually more than we think many Christians live in this despair, actually. Or, or from that kind of a place, we can actually accept the invitation from God to another stage of faith, which is the second stage of faith here, which is a faith or trust of desperation. Can we say that together? Trust of desperation. Say that. Right? Uh, this kind of faith says what? Can you read that quote together? One, two, three. I cling to you even when it hurts. It's a desperate kind of faith. This kind of faith says, I am confused. I don't know. I don't understand. And I'm in pain. It hurts. I feel like I'm dying. I would rather die. It's so dark. Yet I cry out to you. Yet I cling to you. Yet I have no one else or nowhere else to go. Have mercy on me. Right? This is the kind of faith of that second stage. Job enters into this kind of faith, which is portrayed through the entire book, actually, the majority of the book. You see it in his words as he converses with his three friends. Even as he feels totally lost, abandoned, and betrayed by God, because as far as he can tell, he's given his best. And in the midst of when his, when his friends confront him, you should think hard and repent. He's like, I know I'm not perfect, right? He's not, he's not dis, 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 delusional, right? Where he actually believes that he's like, perfect no he understands that he's weak he still falls short but still when he thinks about the suffering and pain that's in his life it's so out of proportion right and he's like what is going on lord and, and in the midst of that heavy pain he says two verses here from the middle of job he says though he slay me in chapter 13 15 though he slay me i will hope in him Yet I will argue my ways to his face. So he's in this desperate faith, right? Where he's like, I got nowhere to go. I, I got to hope in him. Even though I, I feel like he's slaying me, yet I'm going to argue, right? So he's still complaining. He's still bringing himself to God, seeking his face, right? Seeking his heart in the midst of all of this. In, in chapter 23, verse 10, he says, right? He's like calling upon him to and fro in all these directions but there, he's not found anywhere where are you God are you even out there are you even here with me I feel lost I don't know where to go where I'm at but in verse 10 of chapter 23 it says he also says but he knows the way that I take I don't know but he knows and we when he has tried me I shall come out as cold it's crazy right that he demonstrates this 
desperate kind of broken faith. And this is a very precious kind of faith, isn't it, right? This kind of faith doesn't come without actually going through trials. This is a faith that is wrestling, holding on, clinging, and hanging on, even when nothing makes sense. And as Job continues to wrestle and hold on and continues to seek God's face, right, desiring to really have a living encounter with him. And you have to understand here, the movement from the second stage to the third stage, right, is very, very, very significant here. Right? He no longer cares about the blessings and his children and all that. All he cares at this point is what? He's led into this place of, all I really desire is you. I want you to show up. I need to know that you are here. I need to know, right? And it's kind of led into this soul desire of desiring God, which leads to that third breakthrough and third kind of stage of his faith and trust, which we want to call this, the faith or trust of sufficiency. This kind of stage of faith, right, says this. I love you for nothing. I love you for nothing, right? And we're going to unpack that. But in the last few chapters of Job, right, in the, in the final chapters of Job, God, again, right, he finally shows up to Job. He reveals his greatness to him, right? So Job has a living encounter with God, just like he had been crying out, desiring. If you read the whole, the whole book, right, Constantly, he's like, I want to appear before you. Where are you? I want to talk with you. Where? Like, I need you right now. You know, I need your touch. I need your answer. And finally, God shows up, and, and Job is wrecked. He thought this whole time, when I meet him, I'm going to have all these questions, all these things to say. And when finally, he finally is encountered by God, you know what, what happens? I got not much to say. Because <laughs> suddenly, his eyes were literally opened to see the magnitude greatness the transcendence of God and he realizes what I didn't know what I was talking about even though a lot of things that he said was actually true and God affirms him actually God God says he rebukes the friends you are wrong that kind of you know thing is wrong you are actually right you did do well before me Job but again it's neither right God is inviting this into into this deeper thing right but his words are very few he's in awe his vision, listen carefully, his vision of God was so great now that he realized what had happened to him didn't really matter anymore. This is the deep faith of sufficiency. You guys following, right? Job saw the greatness of God, and in that vision of God, he was able to rest in the all-sufficiency of Yahweh. And a key aspect from, uh, moving, uh, from moving from a faith of desperation into that third stage of faith of sufficiency is this, that we take our minds more away and off from ourselves and we begin to place them on God. Because we cannot truly see ourselves until we see God. And as long as our eyes are fixed on ourselves, we won't be able to see God. We have to focus on God if we're going to know that faith of sufficiency, to seek him in his, in his face, right? And it is this revelation of God that makes us sufficient. And that's why towards the end of the last chapter in chapter 42, verse 5, Job finally is able to say this. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes sees you. My eyes sees you, right? It's like now I know you, right? By the way, that's eternal life, right? To know him. He's finally come to know him. The real God that he's kind of lived in ritual. He's kind of lived in it, kind of distant. But now he has this personal encounter with him. And suddenly... There's a sufficiency. So faith of sufficiency says, it doesn't matter. I have God, and, and that is actually all I need. This kind of faith, once again, it says, I love you for nothing. Do you know what the key verse of the book of Job is? I, I agree with Miroslav Volf, okay, who, who, who wrote about this. But, but the key of the book of Job is actually in the conversation, the first conversation that God has with Satan. We talked about it, right? Uh, he shows up before the presence of God and, 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 and you know, who are you, right? And, and, and you know, have you seen Job? And, and what the devil says is key here. What the devil says is key here, okay? He says this. Do you think he worships you and loves you and serves you for nothing? That's the key verse in the, that, that unlocks the entire book here, right? 
Do you think Job serves you for nothing? That's the key theme of this book, right? Right? Because Satan kind of has this faith of propriety. Job's friends have that same kind of propriety. You do good, you get good, you do better. Right? Job himself has it, and that's kind of how it is, right? Because right? usually in our world, we don't love for nothing. We love for something. Right? Why do we, why do we love and serve God, right? To get saved, to get things, right? For wealth, for health, for fertility, for a long life, to get what you desire so God can support you in that, right? And so what's interesting here is there's a common mentality among the comforters, among Satan, and among this world. There's this common world morality that says what? It's this faith of kind of propriety, right? And today, still many people think in this way, right? And even Christian from him. But we have been made to serve and love God with all of our beings, right? Not only for what God gives, but to love God for who God is. Or to use Satan's terminology, to love God for nothing. To love God for absolutely no other reason than himself. That's the kind of faith and trust and relationship that God has built us for. I agree with this statement of, from, from Miroslav. He says, you either love God for nothing or you don't love God at all. You either love God for nothing or you don't love God at all. See, when you love God for nothing, you don't end up with nothing. Can we get an amen, right? Because you have God in him. You have everything you need, actually. And the secret and power of Job's greatness was this, that Job loved and served God for nothing. He, he knew what it meant to be in plenty. He knew what it meant to have nothing and have broken down. But he found the faith of sufficiency in God in relationship with him. Because I have him, I'm good. Right? Guys, this is the core truth that is not only true about in our relationship with God, but it's also true in human relationship if you think about it, right? You know when, when, when couples fall in love, what, what, what do they like to, to ask one another often, right? They're like, hey, why do you love me? What do you, what, why do you love me, right? That's the dumbest question. Do not ask that. Do not answer that especially. Because whatever you say is not going to be enough, right? What are you going to say? Like, oh, because you're so pretty. What's going to happen if I get into a car accident and my face becomes like this, you know? You're not going to love me anymore, right? I love you because, you know, you're smart. What if I, you know, I get something damaged and like, oh, you know? Like, you're not going to love me anymore, right? I mean, whatever you say there is not good enough. Amen, right? So don't ask that question. Don't answer that question especially, okay? Right? What is true love? If you really dive deep into what agape love is, it is all about loving for nothing. That I just love you, right? I love you for you for no reason. I love you for nothing. That's, that's the ultimate place of love. Whether it be human relationship, whether it be our relationship with God. And that's the kind of relationship and depth of trust and unity that God is calling us into, right? To be lovers of God for no other reason but God himself. So we're going to apply this and pray together here. And the application is, is super simple, right? There's just, there's just one application for us to, to this afternoon. And it's basically an invitation to cultivate a growing deepening faith and trust in our relationship with God. That's it, right? That's it. To desire and intentionally cultivate a deepening relationship with God. Last night, I was having dinner with our family, and, you know, we, because my mind is on what I'm going to preach the next day, I ended up talking about Job, right, over dinner and like blah, 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 blah. Yeah. This is what PKs have to suffer through, okay? Um, and then, and then uh, super interesting though, right after, you know, we, we talked, Aiden's like, Appa, I'm scared. I'm like, what's up? What's up? Did something happen? No. Oh, because of Job. And I'm like, what? What's up? I'm afraid that something bad's going to happen to us, you know? And, and I feel like that's kind of a real <laughs> uh, misinterpreted or misapplied kind of message toward, towards us, right? If, if you misinterpret Job, it's kind of like, oh, you better not be too good to get the devil's attention, you know, right, guys, right? That's not a good application, by the way, guys, <laughs> right? So I had to talk to him about it, right? <laughs> you don't have to be afraid, okay? You don't have to be afraid because that's, that's not actually the, the, the main thing, right? <laughs> uh, that's not the main invitation of God, right? God doesn't enjoy, he's not this sadistic God that enjoys in our suffering, right? But he is up to something very deep and profound. 
right? And so you don't have to be afraid in that way like Aiden was, okay? So I know that you guys are like listening and I'm like, I don't know if I want to grow deeper in trust with God if that's, you know? The point, po- point is not like pursuing suffering. Can we get an amen, guys? Because uh, God doesn't, he, that's why he came to suffer so that we don't have to suffer anymore in all eternity. He's ultimately about to do away with it. But while we're in this period, he somehow allows it. And although he doesn't cause it directly, he allows it so that he could redeem it for his glory. You guys following that? So that he could redeem it for, for his glory. The devil tries to steal, kill, and destroy. But God is trying to redeem every brokenness, every darkness, every evil, every suffering and pain. Right? That happens in this world and in our lives. And so here, here's the invitation that, that we're not trying to go out to pursue suffering. Can we get an amen? Please don't do that, right? You don't have to do that. You, don't know, you know why? Because it's, it, we all have our own load of burdens and weight and trials and tribulations on this earth. It's guaranteed. I'm no, I'm no prophet, but I can prophesy that because Jesus said it. In this world, you will have trials of many kinds. But take courage. I have overcome the world. So you don't have to pursue it. You, each of us, and we cannot compare our own unique suffering and pain and loads with anyone else. Can we get an amen? Each of us are walking with our own load and weights. Right? But, but the key invitation is to not waste them. To not get stuck in the process of faith, but actually learn to go from a place of propriety to now wrestling, to be honestly wrestling and contending with God. And, and learning how to strip everything and let go of everything until all you seek is God himself, right? And to be able to encounter him in a deeper way. And when you have the revelation of God's presence with you, I can guarantee you, you will be so sufficient that everything else in light of his greatness and his presence and glory and nearness to you will, will become so small. You guys all follow me, right? Everything else... Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his glorious face. Then the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So here's here's the invitation. We can voluntarily cultivate a deepening, trusting relationship before any suffering comes. Guys, right now, today, you know what it is? It's all about practicing his presence, practicing yielding and submitting everything to the Lord, practicing depending and relying on him, practicing on worshiping and loving him above all else that God has given me already today in the midst, right where I'm at, whether I'm going through suffering or joy or whatever season I'm going through, we can practice it. And you know what happens when you practice this kind of deep, intimate longing and union with God? When trials do come, you will be found ready, just like Daniel and his friends were. They practiced three, three times a day. Every day, sufficiently abiding in God. And you know, when they were about to be thrown into the lion's den and into the fire, they were ready. They are like, I'm sufficient. God's going to save us. He's real. He's with us. And even if we die, praise God, because we will see him face to face and we will have eternal rewards. It's no problem. God is with me and I'm sufficiently found in him. And it's all about cultivating that kind of love. That I love God for nothing. Do you guys love God for nothing? Or do you guys love God for something? And I'm not saying we don't give him thanks and praise for all the things he does. No, those are wonderful gifts. I'm not downplaying them. But as we give him thanks, there's a deeper realm where we love him for for him. Here's also kind of an important, like, insight I want to share is this. You know, it's actually a blessing that God doesn't continue to give you blessings when we are in a faith of propriety. It's actually a curse if God were to continue to just bless us circumstantially when our hearts and faith and trust is not in the right place with God. Because what happens? Deception happens. You guys following, right? You feel like you're righteous and you're okay when you're far away from God. 
And we think that that's blessing, right? Having circumstantial blessing is blessing. But let me tell you, when your heart is not intimate with God and you're not able to trust him and you have all those blessings, that's not a blessing. That's the, the, the most dangerous thing that can happen. It can be the worst curse to continue to live in that deception. That's why in the last day, people are going to stand before the Lord and say, God, we did this, you did this, and this all before you. And God's going to say, but I didn't know you. Right? And so it's in a sense almost a blessing, ironically, that at times he stops spoon-feeding us like a little baby so that we can grow up. That's actually in, in the screw tape letter. Guys, I really highly recommend this. I've been rereading the screw tape letters, right, by C.S. Lewis. And you know one of the things that happens there? You guys know screw tape letters by C.S. Lewis? It's, it's this story about, uh, <laughs> it's interesting, because Uncle Screwtape, which is a senior devil, is discipling or mentoring a younger junior devil called Wormwood, right? And, it's all, and, and, and the language they use is all about how to tempt and destroy human beings. And when they write that book, they call with a capital E, enemy. And the enemy is basically God, right? Because God is their enemy, right? Ultimate enemy. And so they're, they're talking about all these tactics that they're trying to use. But one thing they point out is, is, is this, right? That God, after the initial kind of walk with the Lord many times in our Christian kind of faith as we progress, as we grow in him, he stops kind of blessing in that way. And even sometimes withdraws kind of the emotional like, oh, right, sometimes. It's, it's, it seems desolate a little bit. And the devil and screw tape is like, that's our opportunity to, to get them doubt, you know what I mean? To get them doubt and disappointed and, and disillusioned and fall away. Because it's weird, our enemy allows that, he says. Enemy here is, again, God, right? God allows those seasons to be there. Why? Because he wants them to truly grow as free creatures, to learn who God is and, and become true free worshipers of God that love him for nothing. Right? And this is true in any field of life, guys, right? Whether you're learning a language. In the beginning when you learn a language, it seems so easy because you're only learning uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, right? Oh, yeah, Spanish. But then you get into a little bit of Spanish and you're like, oh, my goodness, orale, amigo, right? So what's going on, right? And then but you, as, as, you, as you kind of go through the hard work of saturating yourself and studying it, you break through and, and you can become a master at it, right? Everything in life is like that, whether a craft, whether a language, whether relationships, and at the end of it, God wants us to work through the hard work in our relationship with him. And in and, and, and that screw tape chapter, it says we got to get him right there. Because once they pass through that and learn how to cling to God in the midst of, you know, being hurt and, and in pain. Once they go and encounter God and receive his sufficiency and they, they know how to worship and walk with him, no matter what season they go through, we're, we're pretty much out of, the, out of the game. That's what the devil says, right? There's nothing more precious in life than this genuine trust and faith in God. You guys believe that? Is anything else more precious in life than that? Than this genuine, pure faith and trust and the goodness and the love of God that we can walk with him. Let's read 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 9 as our last passage together. You guys ready? Let's read these uh, few verses together. One, two, three, go. In this you rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, right, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You know what's crazy? On, on Friday, I was, you know, I, I was working out in the morning. Yes, I, work, I haven't worked out in a whole month, but I did on Friday morning. And I was walking in the park, working, and I, was, I listened to the whole 42 chapters of the book of Job. And then for lunch, I met up with a pastor, Pastor Steve King, right? And we, I, it just randomly happened. It was not planned. One of his members came out, and his name is Stephen. And, and they were half jokingly but half seriously saying that he's a guy that has endured through every disease in the book. 
Now, not n literally, but literally uh, at least a dozen different diseases, including twice cancer, some kind of immune disorder, blah, 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 blah. And even now he has this little, like, uh, he struggles, uh, he, he suffers f with diabetes, right? So he has this automatic thing that injects into his uh, insulin, into his, his system, right? Regularly according to his blood level. And, and, and he's there, you know, taking his truck, serving the church, preaching the gospel, serving the Lord, right? And he's walking with the Lord. And, and so after lunch, I just asked him, yo, bro, you're not going to believe it, but I just read the book of Job this morning, you know? And I look at you, and I'm like, man. And I asked him this question. Like, how was it in your walk and relationship with God? Because he'd been to the hospital so much that he would walk in, and it would take two, three hours for someone to come and put the IV. So he, he would put the IV by himself, right? I mean, he's... He's that acquainted, you know, with, with hospitalization. I mean, he, he's been through so much. He was only 35 years old. And, he, and, he, and, he, and I ask him, with all the, the, the pain and the trials in your life that you faced, how is it, wasn't it hard? How was it, you know, like figuring out the, you know, your faith and trust in God's goodness and, you know, all that? How, how has it been? And he's like, well, those trials is what built and formed my faith today. And he was just so calm and solid about it, right? And I'm like, brother, I admire the faith that you have, right? The depth and, the, and the, the rootedness of your faith because of your story and your walk with him. And he said, it's, it's all God that transformed me and did it in me, right? And I'm like, wow, right? I don't wish that upon myself, my family, or you guys and, at all. Can we get a hallelujah, right? If you don't see, okay. <laughs> we, 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 we're not after that at all, okay? But what we are after, the hope and vision is this, that ultimately, God, we can say that it is you we love, Lord our God, King of the universe. And Lord, that we would have a faith that transcends all of our circumstances and what we see in the physical realm. Because we have a living, present relationship with a God that is transcendent above all else, right? Let's, let's pray together.